Good evening. I am so pleased to be here for the first time in my life. <laughs> I've been to uh, Maine only once before, but not to uh, this lovely place. And I've been here since uh, yesterday evening around 6 or 6.30, and I felt nothing but good the whole time. It feels good. It looks good. It is good. So thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, the title of my presentation is African Womanism, a Global Paradigm for Women of African Descent. What I'll be doing is defining uh, the paradigm within a global perspective. And I would like to open up with a quote, a very important quote that comes from this anthology, which I edited, entitled Contemporary African Theory, Thought, and Action, A Guide to African Studies, in which, um, which of course, uh, we were fortunate enough to have Mark Christian uh, from Liverpool, England, to do the afterword, okay? So it goes like this, quote, an important role for the next generation of Africana scholars will be in establishing without compromise the crucial role of Africana women in particular. Within the same authentic Africana theoretical framework, an authentic African-centered paradigm designed for all women of African descent, that is Africana womanism, has been put forth by myself as the editor. As Africana Studies focuses on the totality of Africana life and the interrelatedness of all African people, and we are talking about men, women, and children, we are very inclusive. All right, so in, so must we uh, look at Africana woman and, and the Africana woman's place and the need for her greater, and her need uh, for the greater family, who have been basically for centuries suffering from racial domination and exploitation. Um, we, she must put, of course, at the top of her list, uh, the whole thing of, uh, of race. So her priorities uh, for ultimately realizing human survival starts with uh, a clear understanding of race and racism. Admittedly, the destiny of the collective African community lies within uh, the concerted collective uh, worldview, wherein African-centered thought and practice must coexist on equal terms. So, I want to pause and put a pin there as I focus on the title itself, echoing the basic definition of African womanism, uh, the editors of Call and Response, the Riverside Anthology of the African American Literary Tradition, that came out in 1980, uh, 1998, I'm sorry, assert that Africana womanism and by extension the Africana womanist quote is, as defined by the theories Hudson Weems is, um, a black woman activist who is family centered rather than female centered, there is a difference, and who focuses on race and class empowerment before gender empowerment, there is a difference. This was outlined very vividly in the book, the first African womanism book that came out in 1993, entitled African Womanism Reclaiming Ourselves. She says, of all, the, the anthology says, of all of the theoretical models, Hudson Weems's best describes a racially based perspective of many black women's rights advocates, beginning with Maria W. Stewart and Francis W. Hopper in the early 19th century. Okay, that's very important to, to get that type of endorsement from a major anthology. So again, back to the quote from uh, Dr. Mark Christian, again, the destiny of the collective Africana community lies within the concerted collective worldview wherein African-centered thought and practice must coexist on equal terms. So we are talking about the activists. Now, Dr. Christian's commentary echoes the very raison d'etre of the family whose overall responsibility is to each other. We, we know this as family members, that we have a commitment to each other. We protect each other. We look out for each other. We support each other, okay? Uh, 
ultimately for uh, the survival, that's mandatory, okay? And it's presented earlier in my um, article entitled, this very thing, African Womanism, the Global Paradigm for Women of African Descent that came out in Call and Response. <coughs> Clearly, it puts forth a challenge for victory on all fronts. And I would just like to quote from that article that came out in 1980, 1998, quote, if African womanism is allowed to reach its full potential, if, that of reclaiming African women via identifying our own collective struggle and acting upon it, then people the world over will be better for it, people. It doesn't matter what your race is, what your, uh, your uh, religion is. It doesn't matter anything, but people in general would be better for it, how and why. A pe when a people take control, when a people takes control over its struggle, success is almost invariably inevitable. When success is one's goal and that is realized, then it makes more, makes for a more peaceful reality for all. It's natural. If you feel good about yourself, then you're going to feel good sharing that good feeling with others. That's just the way it is. <coughs> I remember um, uh, speaking at the uh, University of Rhode Island, and um, I, I remember uh, it was a hard time for me because my oldest brother, they called the, right after I got there, he had been, you know, killed. Uh, by an intruder in his home in Houston. And uh, it was very traumatic, but so many things were happening. I couldn't fly back because they closed the airport the day after I flew in, the hour rather, after I flew in. You know how it is. Black History Month is the shortest and the coldest month of the year. <laughs> so when you get there, you know, that's it. So I wasn't going any place, so I decided, you know, I'm gonna go on for it. But I was talking and I dedicated that um, my activities with African womanism to my brother and to others. And I said, you know, when a person feels trapped and left out and excluded <coughs> and feels that he has nowhere to go and that there's nothing for him or her, when life has nothing to offer, when life means nothing to that person, what do you think that person feels about you? Ditto. Nothing. You're nothing and you're nobody. Because for him or her, he or she is nothing or nobody. Life has no meaning. <coughs> you could be at a grocery store, at a bank, any place. You could be at the post office. And that person's helplessness and hopelessness becomes yours when you become that person's victim. So it behooves us to want each person, if possible, to feel good about himself and herself. That's how it rubs off. That's what I mean when I say that when you feel good about yourself, then it's good for everybody. So <clears throat> when success is one's goals, and those goals are realized, then it makes for a more peaceful reality for all. One is more inclined then to a wholesome and amicable relationship with others, knowing that the concerns of his or her people are respected and met. Now, <clears throat> just for the moment, just imagine the victory you would receive from, say, positive rewards underlined in the above quotation. What do you have if global African womanism is realized? I can say you can have success, you can have peace, and you can have amicability. If for no other reason than for what is stated in the above quotation, and these are the quotations that uh, Dr. Kristen uh, gave us, as well as the quotation from my uh, article, coming from the hearts of a male and a female on equal turf, an African European and an African American, Clearly, an authentic concept for Africana women worldwide should be of serious, a very serious consideration. 
African womanism, the global paradigm for women of African descent, offers an accurate analysis, application, and explication of a challenging paradigm, authentic paradigm, designed for the study and assessment of the lives and works of African women, reflecting both our individual and cultural lives. African womanism then must realistically prioritize, I feel, race, class, and gender respectively. And people want to say, no, nah, what about the simultaneity of race, class, and gender? I don't know how that works. We always do first thing first, at least I do. When I wake up in the morning, my eyes don't pop up and I jump up at the same time. You see, my eyes open and I look around and survey what I'm going to do, what is around me first, and then I rise. You know, we can't do it. I'm, I'm not a juggler. Most of us aren't. Whether we know it or not, we are prioritizing in our everyday gestures, okay? So to be sure, gender, of course, is the... Um, in the equation. We're not saying that gender, because it's listed last, is not important. It is very important because we know, we all know too well, that the female has been the ear of female subjugation for centuries imposed uh, upon us via patriarchy, which is traditionally considered unchallenged. Chauvinism, it had been. It's changed, luckily. However, as Chiama uh, or for, uh, I should say Philomena Chiamastetti puts it in her book called The Black Woman Cross Culturally, and I quote, listen to this very clearly, and this is before African womanism, the, the, the terminology was introduced. When I look at black women going back to antiquity, we've always been African womanist, but there was no name and there was no established paradigm which had been refined for that particular persuasion. So Chiama Steady was uh, basically, I would say, not an African womanist, but she basically exuded all of the characteristics. Later, she endorsed my book, uh, African Womanism and Race and Gender in the Presidential Candidacy of Barack Obama, 2009. She says, quote, regardless of one's uh, position, the implication of the feminist movement for black women are complex. Several factors set the black woman apart as having a different order of priorities. Not the simultaneity of issues, but the prioritization of issues. She is oppressed not simply because of her sex or gender, but ostensibly because of her race, ostensibly because of her race, and for the majority, centrally because of their class. This is very important. I remember going to uh, um, Barbados and <coughs> speaking at the University of West Indies in Barbados. And I mean, it was just beautiful. Uh, I went to this uh, university and they had all these people there, men and women. I like it when you see men and women because I think that we belong together. You know, we need to work things out because when you exclude say for example the male, what you're doing is creating a perpetuation of oppression because they're not gonna change unless there is a dialogue, unless they are afforded an uh, explication, uh, explanation more specifically of why it is that women should be subjugated, they're gonna continue. So I said, okay, the continuation of male chauvinists, I won't say the other word, but you know, that is inevitable unless there is uh, room for an open dialogue so you can say, okay, let me tell you why this is not right, why this is not good, why this shouldn't continue. And then at some point we hope they would say, ah, oh, you know, you have a point there. But if you exclude, they'll never know. That's why it's important that we talk. We need to get it out. So I encourage us to get together. But back to Barbados, when I spoke there afterwards, there was one Barbadian who said, well, Dr. Hudson Weems, I do like the mimic, by the way. I'm a dramatist. Dr. Weems, down here in Barbados, am I convincing? Down here in Barbados, we don't, we don't have to deal with uh, 
that race factor as you seem to have to do uh, in, uh, in North America, because we're in the vast majority here. So the race factor is not really an issue with us. I said, you know, this is in 1995, in South Africa, and of course, you have Mandela recently taken the throne as the president, right? Apartheid had been for years a legal, a legal phenomenon, I would call it that, okay? It was legal, still in 95, up to that point, I would say, legal. Even though the majority of the people in South Africa are black, am I right? And many of them still could not buy what? Property. So it doesn't matter what your um, ethnicity is, where you are, whether you are in the majority or minority, we are informed basically by a so-called dominant culture, okay? And so down in Barbados, you still have a scenario. I told her, you know, listen to this. I'm living in a very swanky suite right on the waterfront. As I walk out my door, I step right on the, uh, the sands of the beach. It's fabulous. And I walk the beach every day, starting in the morning, and I go to the look, restaurant just up, up the way, and, and I have flying fish. I have a ball. And then later on, it's hot out there. I want to stop and shop, but I find it more convenient and comfortable shopping in the boutiques as opposed to shopping uh, at the little outdoor um, venues where they have tables and you know good things granted. But I can't stay too long because it's too hot in Barbados in the summer, in, Ju in June. It's very hot there. And then, of course, I was picked up and taken to um, the parliament downtown. It's beautiful, the parliament. And as the door flung open, the first thing I see is a portrait, an oil painting of Queen Elizabeth. In all of those instances in Barbados that is predominantly black, the ethnic group that's on the top and in control are other than what? Indigenous Barbanians. And I asked that question, why? So what I'm saying essentially is that it doesn't matter where we are. What we want to do is to correct it so that wherever we are, everybody is treated fairly. You understand? And it's something good in there for you. Even if you feel you're giving up something you really aren't, you're sharing what you have, the power and the prestige and the dignity and the whatever you want to think of in terms of what we need to have to make our lives happy and basically convenient and successful, you want to share it. Good things come out of that. At any rate, um, gender is very important, very important. And I tell people that the feminist has no exclusive on gender issues. I would be silly not to talk about gender. I am a female, am I right? And of course I'm going to talk about gender. According to Bettina Affecker, very important person, Bettina Aptheker is a white feminist, and she's the daughter of a very important man by the name of Professor Herbert Aptheker, a Harvard University historian whose expertise lies in the area of slave insurrections. Very important. No doubt he has some impact on his daughter. I mean, she has to know about uh, race issues if her father works a lot on slave insurrections. You know, she knows about Nat Turner. She knows about Gaber, Gaber Prosser. You know, she knows this. And she's been sensitized to race relations, okay? And so what does she say? She says, when we, as a white woman, when we place women at the center of our thinking, we're going about the business of creating an historical and cultural matrix from which women may claim autonomy and independence over their own lives. Makes sense, doesn't it? Again, when we place women at the center of our thinking, that's female centrality. That's perfect. We are going about the business of creating an historical 
and culture matrix from which women may claim autonomy over their own lives. She says, but for women of color, such autonomy cannot be achieved in conditions of racial oppression and cultural genocide. Do you, you see what she's suggesting? That we have to take care of that first, right? It cannot be achieved in conditions of racial oppression and cultural genocide. She says, <clears throat> in short, feminist in the modern sense means the empowerment of women. We hear that all the time, right? The empowerment of women, but for women of color, this is very important. Such an equality, such an empowerment cannot take place unless the communities in which we live can successfully establish our own culture and what? Racial integrity. Unless we can establish our own cultural and racial integrity. She knows too well that feminism itself was designed by white women for white women. And it was fine. Why wouldn't they? They were having problems of being recognized and respected, am I right? They wanted to break silence and find voice, right? But I hardly know a silent black woman. I really don't know too many. I might see one that's maybe doing a little of that, but uh, doesn't last very long because all around her are uh, vocal women, right? Who will tell you when and where to get off, right? So you, I'm doing this because I'm used to this call and response. That's an African tradition. I call, I tell my students, I call and you do what? Respond. You don't have to, of course. You're not my students. <laughs> At any rate, <clears throat> What I'm saying essentially is that she understands, and it's so funny because you have uh, some women who are saying, for example, that they uh, were feminists long before feminists. And I said, says who? You know, you're going to take it from them? Bell Hooks says she wants to move from the margin to the center of the, of the feminist movement. I said, oh, so who invited you to move to the center? Really, when you think about it. It's not going to change that significantly because there's a real need for feminists and they have a real request for things that they really need, right? And you do stick to the agenda. Things that I need, I want to see them first. Am I right? Of course I am. Okay, so I said, um, quite frankly, black women are, are very fortunate I'm not white because I tell them where to get off. So you're going to take my terminology and make it yours, and then you want to change the agenda. You can only be if you can, in some way, make your needs fit the established agenda. That's a sacrifice in many instances. That said, <coughs> clearly Apheca Bettina, like so many before her, such as Queen Mother Yasatawa of Ghana, who led the Ashanti people against the British colonists in uh, the Yasatawa War. Harriet Tubman, the Underground Railroad conductor who traveled 19 times, and my, our colleague here who invited me, reminded me there was many more than 19 times, but 19 known documented times that she went down south. <clears throat> Did Harriet Tubman go down south and say, okay now, I came for my sisters. Did she? No. She went down south for men, women, and children in captivity to rescue them from slavery, from bondage. So was her thing gender exclusivity? No. That you have uh, people like Sonia, Sojona, I'm sorry, Sojona Truth, who was forced to see the need for prioritization of race, class, and gender when she went to an all-women's conference in Akron, Ohio in 1952 <clears throat> and dared to come to the stage and want to talk about the absurdity of female subjugation, being among the women of, uh, being among women, thinking that, hey, you know, I'm, a, I'm in the community, among the community of women, so okay, I have something to say. She instead was hissed and jeered at because she was a black person, not because she was a woman. She was okay at the women's convention but she was black. What she engages in, and aren't I a woman, 
is self-actualization, in which she talks about race first. Just look at that very closely, and I won't do it because I'll have to use the dialect, and not everybody can understand or appreciate dialect. That's the only way I can do it on our woman is to put it in dialect, but so I'll just say, read it for yourself. But she does talk about race first, and then she talks about the class when she talks about no one ever gave her the best place everywhere. And it culminates when she talks about, and then, of course, this man says that women can't have as right, much rights as men because Christ wants a woman. Well, where did your Christ come from? From God and woman. Man ain't had nothing to do with it. She's wonderful. But she deals with self-actualization. She prioritizes, even though she didn't go there intending to, she nonetheless was forced to do it. An anti-lynching crusader herself, Ida B. Wells, who started her investigation of black men and lynchings who had been accused of some indiscretion with women, found out that instead they were posing a threat to the uh, white community. For example, uh, white proprietors, there was a white grocery store owner. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and this happened in Memphis, Tennessee, right on Main, on a, a, a Mississippi Boulevard and Walker Avenue where she started the investigation, she found out that when, like for example, what happened to her friend and his partners when they opened up a grocery store in that black community right there, they were lynched. It was because they offered a threat to the proprietor of the grocery store, the white owner in that community. And Rosa Parks, the mother of the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, and of course later with Mamie Teal Mobley, the mother of Emmett Lewis Teal, the 14-year-old black Chicago youth who became a lynch victim, okay? And later uh, with my 1984 doctoral dissertation in which I established, the first to establish Emmett Teal as a true catalyst of the civil rights movement. All of these culture bearers were family-centered. And family centrality is one of the major, you know, uh, cornerstones of African womanism. And at this point, what I want to do is to um, just define Africana womanism in terms of the basic uh, characteristics or elements describing that paradigm. The 18 characteristics, distinct and diverse, okay, of Africana womanism include, first, you see it up there, we're self-namers. We name ourselves because if you don't, somebody else will name you. You like to say, my name is John or Benjamin or something like that. But if you don't name yourself, somebody else might call you Bobo or Big Man or Little Man, right? And you're stuck with that because it's hard to change it once it's, once it's gotten a hold to you. It's hard to change, right? So up front, why don't you just name yourself instead of piggybacking? that we are self-definers, we define ourselves. Toni Morrison does an excellent job in um, her uh, celebrated novel that she won a Pulitzer Prize for, uh, entitled Beloved. I'll never forget that novel, I love it. You like that? I uh, co-authored the first book on Toni Morrison that came out in 1990, she's great. But in that novel, she has the narrator uh, commenting on the peculiar predicament of blacks during slavery. And she says, definitions belonged to the definers, not the defined. The definers are whites who defined us. We are the defined. Again, definitions belong to the definers, not the defined. Are you with me? I'm going to make sure. In African cosmology, three is magic. A third time I say, definitions belong to the definers, not the what? Define. It is, in with, it is basically within that context that I hear name and uh, reclaim and redefine Africana women. So we are self-definers. We are also family-centered, not female-centered. We can't afford it. There's a wonderful, in the first chapter of this book, reference to a South African um, activist by the name of Ruth Mapati. 
She talks about going in this large auditorium and witnessing all of these decomposed bodies of these children who become victims of apartheid. And so here comes the quotation. It's very magical. Ruth Lapati says in the first chapter here, the South African woman faced with the above situation, this is a quotation, finds the order of her priorities in her struggle for human dignity and her rights as a woman dictated by the general political struggle of her people as a whole. The national liberation of the black South African is a prerequisite to her own liberation and emancipation as a woman and a worker. A prerequisite. It's the liberation movement that comes what? First and foremost. Before dealing with herself as a woman and a worker. We got that. So we're family-centered, that we are genuine in sisterhood, genuine. Uh, it's an asexual relationship. We love our sisters enough to even risk keeping the friendship going. If you know that she's being abused, misused, or whatever, you're going to say, girl, I'm just going to tell you how I really feel about that. That's not good. You need to keep moving. Not because you're jealous of her because she has a relationship or you don't want her to be happy because you don't have one. Not because of that. You're unselfishly concerned that she doesn't get, you know, ripped off or hurt or whatever. Even though you know that she might get so angry with you and it happens that she may disassociate herself with you. But you know you've done the right thing. You cared enough to risk the friendship to save her. Hoping that in her private moments, she may reconsider the circumstance. That makes sense, right? Some girls will say, or some women will say, nah, I'm not going to say anything because, you know, she'll get hot and mad with me, and hey, we won't be the same anymore. I don't care if we won't be the same. I want you to be what? Safe. So I'm going to risk it. That's genuine sisterhood. And you talk about and advise each other. Unfortunately, men don't always have that. Am I right? Boy, the guys will tell you quickly, man, you, you better man up now. Don't let that happen to you, you know. Hey, I don't even want to talk about it. And that's it. But we'll talk right on and on. And then what happened? We just, we're so into it. We, oh, we crying more than the girl who's having the problem. Oh, I'm just, I'm just stressed out by now. You know, your life is so miserable with this guy. I'm just I'm laying out stretched, you know. <laughs> it happens. That's how much we empathize with our sisters. And we are happy when they find the right one, right? I think that's a, that's a good one there. That's a hot number. Oh, wow. You did it, girl. You did it. You got it all of it. You got it all. We really like that. That's sisterhood. That's genuine sisterhood where you love each other. You know, I love the novel by Miriam Abad, the Senegalese writer. She's so wonderful. I analyzed her novel so long a letter, the epistolary novel in the first book, and she says it so beautifully uh, about the sisterhood that she has with the girl uh, when she and her hus husband divorced, and I think she had quite a few kids, you know, and was having a, a rough time financially. Her girlfriend, who had moved on to um, England, I think she worked with some big company in England, actually um, paid, uh, you know, made arrangements and, and paid in full for her to get a fiat car so she can take her kids to school as opposed to walking. I mean, that's friendship, right? When you can share your money, right? I mean, really, that's friendship. I, I, if my friend is having a rough time, I can't imagine hoarding my money if they need it for food, for rent, or whatever. A car, if I have the money to buy a car, I do it. That's what you do out of friendship, right? And she says, friendship has no, um, no uh, boundaries, in a sense. It just goes on and on and on. That's that uh, friendship, and I love it. She says, um, that's friendship. Uh, strong, we're talking about physical and emotional, psychological strength. We are that. We're strong. 
Some people say, you know, we're too strong and too busy to have a break <laughs> or a breakdown for that matter. We just don't have time. We got to keep on keeping on, keep pushing, right? That's strength, okay? That we're in concert with the male in the struggle. We're in it together. In fact, I have a chapter here on, um, listen to this, Mary, uh, 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 what's her name, Terry McMillan, Disappearing Acts. You've heard of that? Maybe and maybe not. Good. This chapter is called Mir uh, Macmillan's Disappearing Acts in it together. Quote, he thinks I have absolutely no concert, no concept of what he might be feeling. And on the other hand, he seems to think that his problem is his alone, but it's not, it's ours. In it together. Okay, so that's on a, uh, uh, you know, on a personal level. But also, there's another quote in this book uh, with um, Donia Lee, a Hakima Bhuti, he's called. This is a chapter called Male-Female Relationships and Sexism in the Black Community. He says here, black couples must understand that black love in the U.S. is much more than a commitment between two people. It is also the realization that there are political, economic, historical, racial, familiar, and emotional uh, forces in impacting upon that love ship. He says, again, on another quote, the root as well as the quality of black life is in the relationship between uh, black men and women in a white supremacist system or society. Black struggle, that is, the liberation of our people starts in the home. So, there they are in it together. We are whole, well-rounded. We are not flat, one-dimensional, static. We're whole, we're complete. That we are also authentic. You know, in other words, it's culturally connected. We do what is basically uh, characteristic of, of who we are. It's just like the, the obvious thing in, in, in reference to food, right? There are certain cuisines that go with certain uh, ethnic groups, am I right? Asians, you're going to have shrimp fried rice. Uh, blacks are going to probably have some greens and cornbread, which I love. Um, what would I say for other races? Let's just stop. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? Am I right? Well, and, and it crosses over. We appreciate it. You know that. You know, I studied I with a, a mine in French, Russian, and German. You know, I've spent a time uh, abroad here and there. And I, then one lady said, oh, you know, Clonora, you know, she's very black and everything, but gosh, she loves escargot. I said, darling, let me make this very clear. I know not only love escargot, I prepare it. When I was in France studying, I took time off to learn how to prepare French dishes. So I make the best escargot this side of France. And I love it. You come to visit me anytime, there's going to be a couple of cans of escargot in my cupboard. And if it's 12 o'clock at night and you want some escargot, hey, I got your back, boo. It's just that quick, you know? So we're authentic. And what doesn't mean we can't appreciate other people's things. You know, I tell people, you know, you love cuisines, different. Oh, I'm going to eat Italiano tonight, and I'm going to eat Mexicano, and I'm going to eat Asian. And soul food and da 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 Well, you tried that and you liked it, didn't you? You might try other cultural uh, nuances. <laughs> try the people and their minds and where they are. You might like that too. Am I right? Makes sense to me. Flexible role player. Oh, yes, that's what we are. You know, we don't have to be trapped into a, uh, a particular role where we have to do all this or all that because we are women or we are men. You understand? But we are different. We were made different. I, I, I couldn't say, well, you know, I had the kid, the first kid, you have the second kid. You know, we're going to split it up, you know. You can never have a kid if you're a male. That's it. You contribute significantly, right? The child is not going to come without the sperm. Whether you get it at a sperm bank or wherever, it still came from the male. Get that right. Don't get it twisted. The male and the female did have to come together in some way, form, or fashion. Am I right? And uh, 
So, and we women do like to save ourselves, you know, because we do have to have these kids. So we don't want to strain ourselves so much to the point that maybe when we want to have kids, you know, we're just kind of stretched out where we can't, we can't bear kids. We overdid it, which is why I always take advantage of when a male comes up to me and say, may I help you like the man who set this thing up tonight? Um, I was carrying my bag in and when I, I roll it and when I get to a step, I would pick it up and I said, oh no, I got it, you know, because hey, I'm a woman like you're a woman, you know, and so who cares who picks it up? But if a male comes in the, in the picture, oh yes, sir, could you pick that up for me? I really wish you will. I tell my students in my class, you know, uh, when somebody needs to go get a chair, an extra chair from another room, I don't look at the ladies and say, go get a chair. I say, will you go get a chair? And flex your muscles. I mean, I'm sorry. That's just the way I feel. I don't have a problem with that. I remember once I had a little um, British Leland, and I would pack it up once uh, two weeks, every two weeks going to get groceries. And I was trying to take everything out at one time, make one trip to the apartment. And this guy walked up to me and said, well, could I help you? I said, oh, thank you so much. He said, well, you know, you have to be careful. I said, well, uh, you don't have to be careful with me on that. When it comes to lifting, you are welcome. Please help me. That we are flexible role players, that's very important. Let me get to that again. Uh, I um, like doing domestic chores because as a kid, I played house. You know how girls learn with the little dolls to do little things, right? So we do observe certain roles to some degree. We don't have to be trapped. If we don't like it, we don't like it. Nobody's going to beat you up because you don't like it, right? But if you like it, that's your privilege. It's OK. Um, I love to cook. And my husband would tell you quickly, you know, um, oh, don't, that's OK, Clonora's cooking. Love, loves my cooking, you know. Uh, but if you come home and you don't smell anything, you say, what's cooking? Excuse me, do you smell it? Obviously, it's nothing cooking. Your question then should be, where do you want to eat if you're not cooking? So we're not trapped in roles, but we are flexible nonetheless. That we are respected and recognized. We like to be respected and recognized as a human being. But what you must understand is that it's reciprocal. You can't talk about the man and say, you know, I'm telling you, boy, they're all dogs. Bam, there it is. In the same breath, they don't know how to respect women. Excuse me. If you want, if you want respect, you got to give it up. You got to respect back. It's reciprocal. Some people don't get it. How do you expect the man to respect you if you're going to disrespect him just because he's a man? Not because of what he does. Tell him about that. But not just because he's a man. You don't go around just disrespecting. You show the same that you want. Respect. It's reciprocal. That we are spiritual. That no matter what your religion is, you know, there is a higher being that is in control. It's obvious. Uh, if you don't agree, that's between you and whatever you, you know you believe in. But I believe that there is something there greater that's in control that has more power than I. There's spirituality that we are male compatible. And I say this: I was at Bryn Mawr and uh, um, Swarthmore uh, two nights in a row in Philly area, and so uh, one of the ladies says, um, "You know, how do you feel about?" Uh, black lesbians being African womanists. I said, the last time I looked at a dictionary, a lesbian is a woman. Prefer same sex, but still a woman, right? So, and I said also, it doesn't matter what your sexual preference is, you have to appreciate the fact that the only way the human race is gonna perpetuate itself is with male and female. At least respect that whether you want to participate in that or not, that is your business and your choice. So we're open to the fact that, that, uh, that we are male compatible in some way, form, or fashion, because that's how the human race is continuing. You know, I remember years ago looking at the Phil Donahue show, and this lady said, you know, oh, God, if you must have kids, you know, go to a sperm bank. I said, hello, where do you think the sperms came from? We know, OK? That we are respectful of elders. We need to start doing that, respecting the elders, because people have gotten to the point today they disrespect them so much. Take advantage of them, beat them, take their, take their belongings or whatever. Forgetting the fact that they have paved the way for us. 
that we are adaptable. You know, we don't have to have, as Virginia Woolf calls for, a room of one's own to become successful. We're adaptable. The kitchen table becomes the desk when the kids go to bed, because I don't have a desk. So it's simple, we're adaptable, right? It becomes the desk. We don't have to have, as Virginia Woolf calls again, a room of one's own with the key and the white gloves in England and I'm going to my office. No, Toni Morrison was very successful rearing her children, her two sons, without having a room of one's own. The kid would even be on a hip, there's one side of her, with the kid on a hip as she's stirring the food in the kitchen. We're flexible that, uh, and adaptable, that we are um, ambitious. It doesn't matter. We know that sometimes it takes two to tango. We need to look out for each other. And finally, that we are nurturing and mothering without apology. We shouldn't apologize for having to take time out for nurturing and mothering. I'm reminded, for example, of Betty Friedan, whom you may or may not have heard of uh, in the feminist mystique, in which she decenters de uh, the family, okay, to the point that, that those kinds of things are called, uh, you know, like one of the latest, uh, Susan uh, Hewlett says, feeble-minded chores for eight-year-olds in reference to the uh, activities and the responsibilities of the mother. I won't read from that whole thing from the feminist mystique, but you've heard of it, right? The family is decentered and it's interesting and very uh, rewarding and uh, comforting that she went back and reassessed it in the second stage and then actually centered the family, and brought the family more to the center. It needs to be. So that's basically what Africana womanism is. I mean, I think you got it now, right? But I'm not through. How much more time do I have? Only a few? Maybe, okay, great, great. I wanted to say, and I'm gonna really wrap this thing up, that um, in 2009, I received a very important correspondence from the chair of the Department of Africana Languages and Literature at the University of Zimbabwe, uh, telling me that we simply had to have an African, international Africana womanism conference there, and it was wonderful. They pulled it off the next year, 2010, October, the uh, activities of the speakers, over 65 speakers from all over uh, Africa, the University of Zimbabwe and other Zimbabwe uh, universities, as well as the University of South Africa, University of Zimbabwe, uh, also, uh, Africa, uh, also uh, American scholars from uh, uh, the um, Cal State of Long Beach, uh, from University of Delaware from coast to coast, uh, University of Oklahoma, University of Missouri, of course, we were there from all over. There were hundreds of people there, and it was marvelous. You had not only um, uh, professors, but you had deans, and you had provosts. I mean, they were there with their presentations. You had the, um, as I said, you had the president, the vice president of the Republic of Zimbabwe uh, delivered the opening welcome. It was marvelous. I enjoyed it so much. Uh, and so, um, and they, they uh, he said that, um, because of the significance and the applicability of an urgency of African womanism worldwide in the face of widespread societal upheaval due to social racism, the university had to pull this conference off, okay? It was great. Um, so what uh, he wanted was a dialogue between basically uh, the scholars, the activists, etc. Uh, in order for them to understand how, just how African womanism can best help us in our quest for authentic um, existence and ultimate survival. So, moving real quickly, I actually gave uh, an opening lecture on the dewomanization, defeminization, and dehumanization, uh, and, and the forward to that book that ensued from that. It was a wonderful, wonderful book, and I could read that. Maybe I should, um, that we were, quote, advancing to a higher plateau, the relativity of an important, all-inclusive paradigm, considering crucial global issues on all fronts, actively engaging in the urgent struggle for human survival against the odds of race, class, and gender oppression. 
the cornerstones for prioritization of African womanism. So African womanism demonstrates um, our brave, passionate, and resolute mission and commitment to the legacy of human survival. And according to uh, Dr. Uh, Mawati, he says, quote, because of the value of womanhood in Africa's development, women's activism and struggles need to be part of the broader effort to rid society of all injustices. Indeed, women need to broaden their uh, struggles to go beyond female centeredness and embrace a gender and a family centered perspective that, tack uh, that tackles the human rights of the entire family. Though I introduced African womanism in the 80s here in the States, it has been used as a theoretical tool of analysis globally since the 1990s. In 1992, I was invited to speak at the uh, first international African diasporic conference at the University of Nigeria in Suka. And it was interesting uh, there, toward the very end, uh, the Ghanaian novelist by the name of Ama Ati Adu came in. And I had uh, another whole spin on who she was and how she felt about um, Africana, about feminism. And she said, uh, she came in very late, I think the last day, because she was actually on a walk or she'd been ill. And so she said, long before feminist, I was a feminist. My mother before me and my grandmother before her. I was, we were strong, vocal, active. We were all of that. And when she got through, I said, you know what? I had a different picture, and I really appreciate your, your novels and everything. I, I was at the University of Iowa back when I taught her courses. I said, um, I was a doctoral student, and you know, as a, you know, students do, graduate students do teach too. And I said, um, but I've got to get this thing straight. Long before feminism, you were all that you say you were, but that didn't necessarily make it feminist, you know. Uh, you were a strong, active, independent, but you obviously in your novels and in life in general, you do what I do, what we do. And I didn't create African womanism in and of itself. I simply refined the paradigm and named it. It was already in existence. It goes way back. I just gave an example of uh, black women in antiquity in Africa. So it was interesting how she uh, didn't find it at all when she thought about it. She said, yeah, I guess it's terminology. I also met a very uh, dynamic woman by the name of Zula Sofala. Dr. Sofala was respected as, I mean, when she come in, people just go, hush. As Sula Sofala, she was the professor and head of the Department of Performing Arts at the University of Nigeria, Ilorin. Uh, and she, um, I invited her to do the forward to my book, which was waiting to be published, just wanted to globalize. And she did an excellent um, uh, introduction to it, uh, forward rather, in which she says, quote, African womanism reclaiming ourselves is not simply a scholarly work, one of those in the mainstream, but our own. It is a new trail blazed with incontrovertible relations on African heritage and gender question. Hudson Weems bravely takes the bull by the horns, confronts the Eurocentric avalanche of words on questions of gender, and puts forth the Afrocentric point of view. I also met another important woman by the name of Dr. Daphne Interi, international scholar who formerly served as delegate to the UN, for Somalia, etc. She did the introduction in which she makes the conclusions uh, relative to African feminism, black feminism, and African womanism. And she does an excellent job. Uh, she says, if, quote, if African feminism admits to the alienation and marginalization of the African woman within mainstream feminism, and she quotes here uh, in this portion, steady, what we have then is not a simple issue of sex or class differences, but a situation which, because of the racial factor, is caste-like cast -like in character on both a national and global scale. That's a direct quote that is from uh, Gia Mastetti. Then Daphne continues, and if black feminism recognizes its peripheral status and clearly espouses a move from margin to center, and that's what Bell Hooks calls for, right? Then she says, African womanism, as proposed by Clonora Hudson Weems, is timely, theoretically fitting, and intrinsically advantageous to the African woman. And I want to wrap it up by dealing with 
one of my favorite writers again, Toni Morrison. You may or may not have heard of her speech called Cinderella Stepsisters, in which she, um, uh, well, which she quotes, uh, which she uh, delivers at the commencement or at some event at Bernard College in the 80s. Okay, so interestingly and surprisingly, this scenario demonstrates how women too often uh, callously subjugate their own women, their own sisters. It happens all the time, usually on the basis of race and class, which could be just as painful and detrimental to their lives as gender oppression. What we see is a violation of genuine sisterhood, which is another cornerstone of African womanism. And I want you, just for the moment, I want you to operate outside of the box, okay? Uh, the, I want you to substitute any of the characteristics of difference that you find, like ethnicity or disabilities or religion, and use that instead of the woman as being different with a different experience or whatever. Morrison is marvelous. She says, quote, I am alarmed by the violence that women do to each other. Professional violence, <coughs> competitive violence, emotional violence. I am alarmed by the willingness of women to enslave other women. I am alarmed by a growing absence of decency on the killing floor of professional women's world. I want not to ask you, but to tell you not to participate in the oppression of your sisters. Mothers who abuse their children are women, and another woman, not an agency, has to be willing to stay their hands. Mothers who set fire to school buses are women, and another woman, not an agency, has to tell them to stay their hands. Women who stop the promotion of other women in careers are women, and another woman must come to the victim's aid. Social and welfare workers who humiliate their clients may be women, <coughs> and other women colleagues have to deflect their anger. This is my favorite part. I had to get a little water for that. I am suggesting that we pay as much attention to our nurturing sensibilities as to our ambition. We are moving in the direction of freedom, and the function of freedom is to free somebody else. I love that. Free somebody else. You are moving towards self-fulfillment. And the consequences of that fulfillment should be to discover that there is something just as important as you are. And that just as important thing may be your Cinderella or your stepsister. In your rainbow journey <coughs> toward the realization of personal goals, don't make choices based only on your security and your safety. Nothing is safe. But in pursuing your highest ambition, don't let your personal safety diminish the safety of your stepsister. In willing the power that is deservedly yours, don't permit it to enslave your stepsisters. Let your might and your power emanate in that place that, in you that is both nurturing and caring." End quote. And I close with this poem that I wrote dedicated to women, all women in general. In order to get it together, you have to begin by being in it together. Men, women, and children. It's entitled, African Womanism, I Got Your Back, Boo. Don't you know by now, girl, we're all in it together. Family centrality, that's it. We're going nowhere without the other. That means the men, the women, and the children, too. Truly collectively working. I got your back, boo. Racism means the violation of our constitutional rights, which creates ongoing legal and even physical fights. This first priority for humankind is doing what it must do. Echoing our first lady, Michelle, I got your back, boo. Classism is the hoarding of financial privileges, privileges we must all have now in pursuit of happiness. Without a piece of the financial pie, we're doomed to have a coup. Remember, each must protect the other. I got your back, boo. Sexism, the final abominable to sin of female subjugation, a battle we must wage to restore our human relations. All forms of sin inevitably fall under one of the three offenses. African womanism, I got your back, boo, corrects our common senses. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor. So I think that we can have a 10 to 15 minute um, question and answers. No questions? No comments. How about that? Don't tell me I did it all. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, Thank my you. name is Ama. Um, my question is about the role of women um, in concert with male in struggle. Mm -hmm. So I know that, um, or at least like a contemporary example is like the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a lot of women who are in like the um, forefront of it and they are usually um, very outspoken about talking about uh, police violence towards black males. Mm -hmm. However, it seems as though in the other end, it doesn't seem as though males are very um, outward about supporting the black females. I was wondering if you could speak to that or you have any opinion. I that. didn't hear the last part. You said men, it, on the other hand. Yeah, on the other hand, black men are, don't speak as much to um, violence that, are, that is put on black women. Mm -hmm. So it's not reciprocated in the same manner. And I wanted to know if you could speak to that in terms of um, Africana womanism. Well, I, I think that what we need to do is that we need to call it out. Sometimes when you don't say things or say, I'm looking at you, I see you, and I don't hear you, it continues. You have to say, do you see me? I see you. Do you love me? I love you. You know, I, it's reciprocal. So while I'm supporting you because I'm a mother in a sense, whether you actually have a child or not, you know, you are uh, the mother of the children, you know, in a sense, that I do that passionately because that's what women do. Am I right? It was a woman who nurtured you, you tell that guy that. She's the one that nurtured you and mothered you to make you what you are today. You need to return that same type of love and caring and protection that she's done for you. So I think that the responsibility, sometimes the onus is on us, when, not that it should be, but when we find ourselves being dissed or dismissed or disrespected or whatever, we need to say, hey, it stops here. I see you and I don't hear you, or I hear you and it's not what I need to hear. Be vocal and speak out. Don't just keep on. Say, I want you to come forth and help me to be a part of what is happening to me too. Support me. Look out for me. Okay, protect me. See, because a lot of times men think that they don't have to because we're so busy protecting them and cuddling them and nurturing them that we don't make them do it back. You know, it's an interesting thing. I had a girlfriend uh, once and, you know, she was so swell in support of her husband, you know, and did everything for him. Uh, both of them were educators. Uh, he was in business, and he had a fine office down on uh, Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago, you know. Uh, and she was, uh, you know, a high school teacher, and and she did everything. They had to, she had four kids, and you know, doing all that. And every day, she called me. And she says, "You know, Glenora, I crowned him every day. I crowned him." I crowned him and made him feel proud and made him feel good about himself because he was hitting it all the time as a black man, right? And now he's, he's divorcing me because he doesn't want me anymore. He's found him somebody else that he likes more than me and I've done everything. What do I do? I said, no, it's not what do you do, it's what didn't you do. You didn't make him crown you back. No king wants a serf. Do you know a king that wants a serf? Am I right? You were a serf. You only served him. You never demanded that he serve you back. That's what we got to do. We got to say, excuse me, but it's, it takes two to tango. Don't always find fault in me because I can ditto find fault in you too. We've got to compliment it. I just want, can I just read a quick from uh, this book on um, Miriam and Bob so long a letter? Listen to this. Okay, now you might not be talking about love itself, right? But it extends over to this. Let me show you what she has to say in so long a letter. Oh, I love that 85-page novel. Oh, God, it was great. But this is what she says at the end. She says, I remain persuaded of the inevitable and necessary complementarity of men and women. Love 
imperfect as it may be in its content and expression, remains the natural link between these two beings, to love one another. If only each partner could move sincerely toward the other, if each could only melt into the other, if each would only accept the other's successes and failures, if each would only praise the other's qualities instead of listing his faults, if each could only correct bad habits without harping on about them, if each could penetrate the other's most secret haunts to forestall failure and to be a support while tending to the evils that are repressed. The success of the family is born of a couple's harmony as the harmony of multiple instruments creates a pleasant symphony. The nation is made up of all the families, the rich and poor, united or separated, aware or unaware. The success of the nation therefore depends inevitably on the family. And just a word, not a long expression, uh, in reference to the list of the positive and negative Africana uh, a, a male female relationship, that's what it's called. I just like to say that there is a list here of 12, 15, I think it is. It is 15. And you have to realize that basically, when you have love, you're going to have the opposite of that is contempt. And I could go down all of them. But one of them is complementary, complementarity versus critical. Don't just let somebody criticize you all the time and you never have anything else to say back, okay? Say, you're not perfect either, but I love you enough to think about those things and to praise you for those things. I want the same thing. I want, to, I want you to stroke me back. Okay? Thank you for that question. Any others? Mm -hmm. Hello. Hey. Um, I remember you're mentioning, I think it might have been earlier when you visited our French class, um, that you ha had a lot of pushback when you wrote your dissertation on Ebbett Till as the catalyst of the civil rights movement. Yes. I'm wondering if you might think that, I don't know, nowadays going back and sort of revising or not revising, but sort of taking new looks at history is like something that's more uh, more encouraged now after after your work, or is it still something that receives a lot of resistance? Uh, well, basically, uh, I think that the whole thing, concept of Emmett as catalyst is household word, uh, and it's a household name now, Emmett Teal. When I first uh, unearthed Emmett Teal uh, in 1985, and uh, went up against the academy at the University of Iowa uh, at the um, uh, proposal uh, that I defended uh, in uh, the fall of uh, 1986, uh, right after the uh, public announcement that I had been uh, one of the selected 35 uh, national Ford Fellows out of over 900 applicants. And they were proud of that because I was the only Ford Fellow in the state of Iowa. So they wanted to be good with me. They wanted to be fair with me. But they had a hard time because the thesis was so so difficult. Because as they said, I mean, what happens to all the historians who built careers and books, written books on the the catalyst as being Rosa Parks? I said, well, it just needs to be corrected because Emmett actually happened three months and three days prior to, and that it set the stage in essence of the Montgomery bus boycott. And even Mamie, not Mamie, but uh, Rosa Parks, much later, years later, admitted that when someone asked her why didn't she go back to the back of the bus, she said she thought of Emmett and she couldn't go back. So uh, I had to, you know, just stand up hard on that. And they said, well, what happens if you can't defend a dissertation? If you can't just say it's a, it's a very uh, significant fact in the rise of the movement, if that won't work for you, what happens if you can't defend a dissertation? I said, it's simple. I don't get a PhD and I'm willing to take that chance. Now, that said, I'm saying that in reference to your particular question, there are a lot of people who still, believe it or not, still, it's getting out there now. It took at least 17 years before they caught up with me. And now everybody's saying, but... It took, it's still people out there who still don't really know the whole story and they still haven't accepted it. And then moreover, there are people who don't want to look at, as I call the true ugliness of American racism staring us in the eye. People don't want to deal with it. They want to stick their head in the sand, right? You have a lot of young people today who feel that um, it, it's not important. It happened a long, long time ago when in actuality now we see that is happening right before our eyes. That was one of the things that was brought to me when I was at the University of Utah. The man said, to one of the uh, reporters said, you know, that happened a long time ago. Why today? 
I said, you know, just look at what's happening. It's grown a lot since this is back in the 90s. I said it's grown a lot since then. I said it's, it hasn't stopped. In fact, it's growing again. It's growing. We see it, don't we? Every time we look around, there's something else happening. You know, we've got to respect and love each other. We really have to. My last book on uh, Emmett, Emmett Legacy, Redemption, and Forgiveness, not only uh, deals with the establishment of TLS Catalyst, but also deals with the spirit of redemption, the story of the 35-year-old attorney, 34, I believe he was, who represented the murderers in the trial in 1980. I'm sorry, 1955, and he said, every last Anglo-Saxon one of you has the courage to free these men. Your grandfathers would turn over their graves if you found these men guilty. And they did. They freed them just like that. But he was later very remorseful when he thought about it, and he spent his life atoning by representing poor blacks in the state of Mississippi pro bono. I said, Attorney Whitten, you're doing good. That's how you get redemption, is from doing good. You can't change history, and you need to tell people you know that if you made mistakes, tell me someone who hasn't. They could be real big mistakes like his, okay? But they are mistakes nonetheless. We need to recognize our mistakes, then we need to try to atone, do something to, to in some way say, I'm sorry. Do something, like Mr. Whitten, you know, and, and try, and as he said, I hope it really has changed my life, and I hope it changes the lives and hearts of many. We want people to stop doing what they're doing, okay? And what you don't understand is that if this thing keeps on the way it's going, you're not going to have a happy life either. You understand? It's not about you just helping somebody else. It's about helping yourselves and your family and your future as well. Because if we live in this kind of discord, we can expect a whole lot of negativity and damnation forever, a day, and a year. You know, it has to stop. And you need to reach out and say, I want to be a part of saying, let's call it to a halt. Okay? And for those who don't talk about it, maybe we should talk about it. Say, so have you been looking at TV? A lot of us don't. But have you been, or have you been reading the papers? Or do you know about this and that and the other? Let's talk about it. How do you feel about it? What can we do? What can we do? The students have always been active. I was an activist as a student, you know. What can you do to contribute to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the correcting of social ills? So childhood ills can be a monster. And just because you don't talk about it, it's not going to make it go away. It, it usually just festers and get even bigger because people are thinking about it. It gets bigger and bigger. You need to say, let's talk about these things, you know. Is it OK? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, Doctor. Thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could um, put your concept of Africana womanism within conversation with more contemporary thinkings around black feminist thought, although I know you distinguish Africana femi uh, womanism from black feminism proper and womanism proper. But the language of intersectionality, I think, is interesting sort of uh, theoretical tool to think about the way black women in particular experiences experience their uh, various forms of challenges in relation to anti-racism on the one hand and sexism, sexism on the other. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how African womanism features or does not feature within this concept of intersectionality particularly. Well, basically, I think that uh, African womanism does whatever anything else does. It just basically prioritizes how it how it deals with these issues. It doesn't exclude the issues. It just prioritizes the issues. And it always holds the family as being the penultimate concern. So uh, where, that is, where that is missing in other paradigms, it needs to be reconsidered. That was certainly what uh, Betty Friedan did. Uh, and people ought to realize that just because of the fact that uh, once upon a time, they thought that it was only about this. Maybe you understand why when feminism first came around, it was all about the woman as being centered, right? Because that was a big thing that they were dealing with, right? That was a big concern. But today, I mean, things are just, I mean, we, we are, we're not over it. It's still a whole lot of sexism going on, right? 
female subjugation. We just need to also realize that we can't afford to decenter the family. We have too much to lose. And my thing is, uh, at, uh, in no sense of the imagination am I going to downplay uh, the thing that I feel is most important, and that is race and racism. And some people don't want to talk about it. They want to pretend that this is the post-colonial era. <laughs> what makes it post when it's still living, alive and well, right? Racism is still rearing its ugly head. So how can it be post, right? We still have to put it on the front burner until people start saying, let's correct this societal ill. Let's correct it. Then once it's corrected, I can put it to rest, put it to bed, end of story. But that hasn't happened. And too many of us pretend that it's not. Oh, you're playing the race card. There you go. I say, excuse me, I don't have to play the race card since you already did it. Be able to recognize things and call it what it is. See, sometimes people are okay as long as you don't confront them with it. As long as you don't call it out, they're cool with it, you know. But once you call it out, it's uncomfortable. It forces people to deal with it. Does that answer you in some way? Good. I'm sure it's a lot more I could say, but that's all I can say now. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so I think we'd have to thank everyone for being here and so attentive to uh, this precious information on Africana womanism you've brought us. Uh, Professor Hudson Wims, thank you very much. Thank you. And there are books. By the way, this anthology has a whole section. This is an edited book. Africana, Contemporary Africana Theory, Thought, and Action. I only have a few of those, I three. But it has a whole section of seven chapters 